Amazon refuses to remove apparent AI knockoff of LifeSite journalist's new book on St. Alphonsus Liguri. I'm reading this title on LifeSite News, which is an article written by Stephen Cox in early September. Stephen Cox wrote a book on St. Alphonsus Liguri, and he's claiming in this article that an artificial intelligence bot somehow got a copy of his book and republished it in a way where it just changed what it needed to change to not be copyrighted or or claimed as as plagiarizing. Now, that's absolutely insane. If you read this article, you'll probably be pretty amazed at what actually happened. Things like this are going to continue. The rise in artificial intelligence is going to be so powerful and it's going to persist and, and generate and further so many evils that we are experiencing in our day and age, socially and politically and even spiritually. Have a listen to this clip by Tucker Carlson, James O'Keefe, and Charlie Kirk, some of the greatest conservative commentators in our day and age, talk about the evils that are coming forth from the development of artificial intelligence and how what Stephen experienced isn't anything out of the ordinary. In fact, AIHQ, those involved in the development of artificial intelligence, are actually doing this with things like the Bible. They're trying to rewrite the Bible, believe it or not. And I'm not making this up. And I'm no expert, so don't take it from me. Have a listen to this clip. Tucker was asking about the, the, the people and the companies behind the creation of these computer systems and AI. And I said, actually, James has some deep insights into what these companies do. Yeah, this, this um, well, you said it today, Charlie, about the Ten Commandments within IBM. Yeah, I IBM. said it on, on PBD's show. I connected all the stories together because they're two seemingly unrelated stories. So IBM announces all this AI growth and their stock goes up. And then James O'Keefe reveals that they have the Ten Commandments that govern the values of IBM. And so basically IBM is telling you that they're creating a woke super weapon. This is, is so demonic. No, no, that, that's basic. And the, exactly. And the Ten Commandments are not, you know, the ten that were revealed to Moses. On I'm Sinai. They're, they're, they're literally like that white people can't be racist, that black people can be, do nothing wrong, that Ali should. It's literally it a, says, a, quote, understand only white people are racist. Yeah. It, 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 wow. it is the woke. Is that an exact quote? It, it That's is an the, exact quote. It is the, the woke anti racist decalogue, is what. And you said something pretty profound. You said that eventually AI will make this the actual Ten Commandments. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, yeah. If, if you think for a second, I mean, they're, they're, you, Yuval Harari has already said that artificial intelligence is going to rewrite its own religion for Bible stories that, quote, make more sense for people. Wow. So, Tucker, <laughs> exactly, Tucker you, yeah. you, you said that they were creating a god. They're creating a demon. They're creating a devil. Uh, a, well, it, a false it, god. So, if but, not, absolutely. Absolutely. Bail, no, yeah, but, for sure. No, it's a, it's a demon, but they're, but what's so interesting is at least, you know, in the, the whole management kerfuffle over there at AIHQ, um, the letter that got him bounced briefly from the helm said these people are, are like, you know, dancing around the proverbial fire worshiping yeah. this thing. And I'm like, of course they are. They have of the course they're calf. rituals attached. Yeah, they have the golden calf in no, there. For yeah. real? This, but this is, just, just to go off, to, but it's important, the, their stated goal, and he, Yuval Harari uses Bible stories all the time. That's what's so creepy. He talks about like, like the, the flood. He talks about the Tower of Babel. They, since Nimrod tried to create the city of Babel in Genesis 11, they've been trying to reconstitute a oneness of the government and a oneness of the world. They think artificial intelligence will allow it. It's a one world government that they have always been after. But that's what Genesis, and they're going to do it. Through that, that's why crack. God scattered the people. Ba Babel means God confuses. Babel, God confuses. Because God does not want a one world government. Yeah. And, he wants nations. He and wants now you people. add that to the fact that a lot of that's people right. think, especially politicians like Netanyahu, that believe that we're in the end of times. And when you see his conversations that he has with Elon Musk, especially when it comes to artificial intelligence, a lot of things start to come together when it comes to the time that we are in right now that is going to be absolutely decisive for humanity. We could either be totally free or totally enslaved. And I want that decision might not be ours. Now, whether you're an atheist or whether you're a Catholic, you'll probably agree that one of the greatest writers of all time was J.R.R. Tolkien. He wrote one of the most popular novels in human history, the Lord of the Rings mythology. And so today I'm going to be discussing how Tolkien's Lord of the Rings mythology completely relates to what Tucker Carlson and company were discussing in that video and how it relates to what Stephen Cox experienced. These two writers claim that everything J.R.R. Tolkien wrote in his Lord of the Rings mythology is completely Catholic and relates and even predicts and prophesizes what we are experiencing today with the rise of artificial intelligence and the battle between good and evil with so many rising new issues like transgenderism, and transhumanism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many new evils that 
Really, we would have never been able to predict, but they claim J.R.R. Tolkien did predict this, and that it does, and it will continue to get worse. Ali Ghaffari and Paul List, thank you for joining us here at LifeSite News. Why don't you tell the viewers that are watching us why I'm interviewing you uh, about artificial intelligence, about the clip we just watched. Why am I not interviewing Tucker Carlson and Charlie Kirk and James O'Keefe? Why am I interviewing these two guys? And, and what do you know uh, about artificial intelligence and uh, all that surrounds this, this very, very big topic that we're going to discuss today? Uh, it's because it's directly relevant to our book. Tolkien uh, predicted everything uh, when he wrote The Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion. Um, everything that Tucker Carlson and company are talking about uh, was directly uh, related to our book, and we prove it here, and Tolkien gives us the answer to all these issues these guys bring up. Our expertise in any of this matter is directly related to our expertise in the Tolkien mythology. From my perspective, we provide a um, value in that we're coming at it from an angle as everyday people who uh, whose lives are impacted by all of these technologies and things that are impacting uh, our day-to-day -day lives. We can, but we can also see ahead um, with eyes to you know, with an understanding of history, an understanding of our faith, and then looking ahead and seeing how this is going to impact our faith, our church, our, our lives, our souls, uh, with great concern, uh, with clarity, without the, um, the impediment of, you know, politics or money, or all of these things that tend to cloud the judgment and the, the vision of folks who may be in a, uh, in a, in a position where, you know, that's where their life is, their livelihood is um, is in you know in media in politics things of that nature. So I think we we've, we've got the benefit of being hobbits in the Shire uh, where we can just really tell it like it is without having to uh, to be beholden to Sauron. When I said this is a very big, a very vast, complicated topic that we're discussing, uh, a lot of viewers might say, "Well, what the hell even is artificial intelligence? What what is this? You know, AI thing? You know, is this some sort of?" version of the terminator you know that famous hollywood movie is this some sort of big conspiracy doomsday thing that's never really going to come true you know a lot of people look at that and might think this is just it's you know it's a it's a it's a theory it's um, a fantasy it's not real it's not really affecting our day-to-day -day lives yet you know people are always saying you know that the world is going to end and this is just some big doomsday thing that some mega computer is going to hack our whole world i mean it sounds a little absurd and it sounds crazy. So can you simplify um, this this whole topic? Uh, simply put, what are we up against? What is artificial intelligence? Why does it pose a threat? And and, and, and really, what, what is this whole topic about for the average person? How can you sum this up for us? Uh, to sum it up very briefly, um, the fall in Adam and Eve uh started the process of uh man worshiping himself trying to be god um and eventually that would come around with the advancement of human knowledge uh and technology that we would actually create a machine in our own image that we would worship and we would ultimately um enslave us and potentially destroy us and uh, Tolkien saw that a long time ago with his experience with Alan Turing before World War II, most people don't know about. Um, and it's no, uh, it's, it's nothing, uh, it's very serious, um, serious enough that it's been, uh, it was Tolkien's priority since he wrote the publication of, of The Lord of the Rings and after. Um, he was a big uh, skeptic of machinery, as most people know, and this is the ultimate machine. Um, it mimics our capacity to think, although it doesn't think, it computes. Um, and it uh, derives conclusions via uh, statistics and probabilities um, and imitates the human thought process um, very well and fools a lot of people. Um, that's a dangerous thing. And it is, it's already here. It's, it's already in a position where there's no return. You can't put this genie back in the box. You know, this artificial intelligence is the latest fruit of 
um, a, a philosophy that goes back to Francis Bacon and to Rene, Rene Descartes and the desire to become masters of nature uh, and to focus less on God and serving God and to live a life of human flourishing under um, the kingship of God, but rather to uh, to create masters and to become gods ourselves. Um, and in this process of becoming masters of nature, we create this technology, we become more and more powerful, but also at the same time, more reliant on this technology and thus weaker at the same time. So it's this, this trade-off that we are trading our freedom and our ability for greater seemingly power, um, but at the same time, becoming slaves to this technology, to this power. And so this is, I think, the 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 ultimate of the giving away of power to technology, to uh, some other entity that is not ourselves, that is not God. I mean, I'll just put it into a military context. What scares me uh, is the idea of autonomous weapons, which are making decisions of life and death over human beings. So we just send these machines out, um, kind of like a Terminator, uh, where we've got autonomous submarines, autonomous uh, aircraft or um, robot soldiers, things of those nature of that nature that are making these decisions without a man in the loop wow. uh, in life or, or death and taking taking people out. And so so that is the ultimate in giving over of control uh, of us and we become slaves to these and victims to this this monster that we've created ourselves. So you two wrote this very thick book uh, looks and sounds kind of scary, Mount Doom. Why <laughs> am I bringing um, this book forward to our viewers here at LifeSite News? Why am I interviewing you two? And how does this book relate to the clip that I just played of Tucker Carlson and James O'Keefe and Charlie Kirk and all those other conservative commentators talking about artificial intelligence? How do how does this book relate directly to that? And uh, why am I not interviewing them? Why am I interviewing you two about this uh, this topic? Can you you know uh, give a summary of who you both are and, and what this book is about? Oh, I'll start. Um... We're bringing it uh, because the world needs to know that uh, J.R.R. Tolkien uh, knew this was coming very clearly in the 1950s. Um, so he wrote a fairy tale, quote unquote, a fairy tale unthreatening um, to show us where we've come from, where we've been, what our problems are, where we're headed with this machine. Sauron is artificial intelligence, by the way. Um, so is Sauron, Sauron is who? Who, who is Sauron? Sauron is artificial for... intelligence. He's the adult computer, according to Alan Turing, uh, if you read Alan Turing's work. But, um, but J.R. Tolkien writes about Sauron. Who is Sauron to J.R. Tolkien? Who is that? Sauron is the big bad guy, the, the, the one with the, that, that created the ring. He lives in the mythology. Yeah, he's the, he is, uh, he is the, uh, the, the big bad guy in The Lord of the Rings at the movie, you know, with the eye of Sauron. Um, um, we bring this uh, particularly to the Catholic audience because we, we want to make sure that the Catholic audience are the ones that are uh, first aware. Cap uh, Tolkien was a devout traditional Catholic, um, very devoted to the faith, devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary. His mother was uh, martyred for the faith. Uh, we dedicated a book to his mother, Mabel Tolkien. Um, and it's time that we bring Tolkien up front and center in the battlefield put him right there. The mythology is probably the most popular literature in the world. It's it's sort of saturated the whole world. And now it's really time for people to understand what it is. And the, the beautiful thing about Tolkien's work, he doesn't just point out our issues and the dangers that we're in and the struggle that it that it will take, but he gives us the answer. He gives us the solution. And the ultimate solution is virtue. We have to become saints. So I, I want to get to that. You mentioned mm -hmm. something with the solution to this whole topic or, or, or situation is uh, that clip I just played. Um, Tim Pool, one of the commentators, mentioned something uh, very interesting. But we're gonna we're gonna get to that later on in the interview. Ali, wh who are you, and and what are you uh, doing in this interview, and and what 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 knowledge do you have to bring forward uh, with this book, Mount Doom, and um, this whole this whole topic of <laughs> everything we're we're discussing today. So yeah, my name is Ali Gafari, and I am a convert to the church. Um, Paul was God's chosen instrument for bringing me to the church, and we have a had a relationship for thirty years. And um, under in Paul's influence, I joined the Navy. I uh, was a Navy officer for twenty years, flew F-18s, 
and uh, taught at the Naval Academy Leadership and Ethics. And during the time, you know, went to some of the, the top schools in the country, um, according to worldly standards, and really experienced this life of uh, really what I think Tolkien was was warning us about in, in you know, in some sense in, in his mythology and live that life and experience the rotten fruit of that. Um, and then came into the church and got to see the beauty and, um, you know, the, of the Catholic faith, of our history, of philosophy, of theology properly understood. Uh, and so I've lived, you know, I've lived the what Tolkien is warning us against, and I've lived what he's urging us to do. Uh, and so my life kind of mirrors and impacts it's it's drawn in and I think in many many ways many of our lives are but for me personally Paul had asked me for a number of years to help him write this book he'd been thinking about it and ruminating on it. he said I know I need to write this book I need someone to help me pull this thing together and you know my personality is to get things done and he said I know that I can get this done with you just please help me and after five years of putting them off I just said all right finally uh, I've got time now let's do it and so we just went to work um, and over the course of five years, pulled this book together, and that's something that we're both very proud of. So, you mentioned, Ali, what Tolkien is warning us about. What is Tolkien warning us about? You know, can you take a stab at that? Yeah, certainly. Can you sum it up for the average person that doesn't really know anything about the Tolkien mythology, the Lord of the Rings? Like, I don't, I've never read Lord of the Rings, but... But why is this, you know, knowledgeable for, for me to have? Why is this important for me to understand? And and just to sum up for the average viewer here at LifeSite, what is Tolkien, uh, Tolkien's mythology really about? You know, I think this is might this might be the first time viewers at LifeSite and around the world in the Catholic circles have ever heard of a different interpretation that the Lord of the Rings is really deeply about something else. So so what is that, and how can you sum it up for us? Tolkien has a lot to say, so it's hard to sum up in a something very pithy, but. But I'll, you know, I'll give one element of it, and that is the battle that goes on inside in each and every one of our hearts. Um, it's the battle between good and evil that is occurring uh, in our souls, in our bodies, with the world, in our interaction with the world. Um, and it's a battle between the desire to sin as a result of original sin and concupiscence uh, and the desire uh, to do good. And God's calling for us to be saints. Uh, and that that battle is a battle that we need to be aware of. Uh, first of all, and many people today are not aware of that battle. And I think that's part of it is just saying, hey, wake up, this battle is going on and, and you have to take control um, of your will by bringing in these good habits, these hobbits, these virtues uh, that you need to encourage and to grow these virtues to help you know, vanquish the sin, the ring, you know, all these, the negative, this, the orcs in Urukai, these sins that are in your life your lives, uh, you need to vanquish those in order to achieve joy, uh, to bring back to God and to put him where he belongs in your life, uh, to achieve eternal salvation. Uh, and so there's a, there's an element in there for every single individual human being, um, of, you know, becoming a saint. Uh, and so I think that's, that's one element of it. And I know Paul can, can, can touch on others. So Paul, you know, um, Ali just mentioned the battle that's going on between, each and every one of us, the battle in our hearts, you know, the desire to sin and the desire to be virtuous. That sounds, you know, very true. But how does artificial intelligence specifically tie into this? Uh, again, to the clip that we just watched with those conservative commentators, how does artificial intelligence, you know, play within this battle between good and evil? Well, first off, you got to put the mythology in its proper context, which it's never been put in the proper context until now. Um, our book points out, makes it very clear that it's a scholastic mythology. It's uh, it's rooted in St. Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologia, um, <clears throat> which was rejected at the Reformation. And um, it's it's really, uh, Middle Earth is material brain. It's inside, our, it's actually the organ of thought, the material brain. A man across the sea is the immaterial portion of the human intellect. Um, and once you realize that it's a psychological um, it's a psychological um, mythology, and it's not material in this world. All the all of the characters take their place very neatly, including all of the enigma, like who is Tom Bombadil and who's Dol Goldberry. It's, it's very clear in the psychology that Tom Bombadil is the rational will. Goldberry is the conscious intellect and the, and the conscience. 
um, all the, the hobbits are habits. The four hobbits are the, are the cardinal virtues. Um, that's very obvious. Gollum is intemperance. Um, the wizards, the five wizards are the five ways in which uh, we, we acquire wisdom according to Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Gandalf is philosophical wisdom. Saruman is practical wisdom. Now he's academia and he's taken over. Wormtongue is his slave, the modern Marxist teacher. Um, Radagast is rational intuition. All of the characters take their place and it becomes a psychological battle for the material brain. Baradur is the microchip. The one ring is ones and zeros, it's digital. One ring, zero, it's digital. Um, it's the language. Um, so you've got with, with, with the mythology placed in its proper environment, which is the human psychology, it's, it's applicable to the individual person, no matter who they are, because they, we all have these fundamental human psychological characteristics are all part of us um, and they affect us in different ways but but it's a battle for the for the control of Arda which is a person an individual person within which Middle Earth is the material brain and it's a battle and it is the microchip the 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 the, the black riders are virtual reality they're the servants of virtual reality and uh, it's very of course it's very complicated but it's all spelled out very clearly in our book and once you realize and understand that it's just, uh, it's undeniable. That's exactly what it is. And it's time now in God's time, uh, God prepared me to do this. Uh, and then he gave me a Lee, the ultimate get her done <laughs> kind of guy, because I wouldn't have done it without a Lee. And, uh, and we did it. And so now we really need to get this book out and this awareness that J.R.R. Tolkien is on our side. He shows us the way we need to, to uh, we need to, uh, cultivate virtue um, uh, as diligently as possible. And if we do that, uh, artificial intelligence has a very minimal grasp on us if we cultivate virtue, because the trap is vice. The trap is pornography, particularly with young men. And uh, if we avoid, like any other trap, avoid the, avoid the bait. Don't take the bait. And the one way that you take the bait is to indulge in these sinful activities. And once you do that, AI has a grasp on you and a real hold on your psychology, your emotional system, your physiology, everything. And it's very, very, very difficult to escape. So once you cultivate virtue, cultivate the Catholic, the traditional Catholic faith, it gives you all of the tools that you need to recognize the bait, to recognize the trap, and to avoid debate at all costs and rise above. And artificial intelligence is not going to be something that we can completely avoid. It's going to have a grip on our, on our finances. It's going to have a, a grip on our personal and professional lives in many, many levels. But if we keep it out of our personal psychology and we don't let, us, don't let it get its, its evil claws and teeth into us with vice, then we have a huge advantage. And that advantage will make us not invulnerable to artificial intelligence and its influence, destructive influence, but it will make us aware, very much aware, so we're not fooled and we're not captured and, uh, and we can avoid the trap. And the trap is virtual reality. Yeah. So um, what you're talking about seems mind-blowing. It sounds so interesting i mean i i don't know how else to to uh to praise it because it, it just sounds it just sounds mind-blowing i mean and i know you know again i've never read the tolkien uh, mythology but i know within the catholic circles especially tolkien is like there are tolkien nuts there are tolkien fanatics out there that just can't get enough of this mythology and i've never again really been into that but you know what do you say to those people that are that that have been you know, just reading and reading and uh, living this mythology of, that J.R.R. Tolkien wrote, you know, um, what do you say to them that have never heard of what you're talking about? How, how, how did you come up with this interpretation that what Tolkien writes about in his mythology is, is everything you're describing now? How, what would you say to those Tolkien uh, readers out there that have never really uh, saw the, the mythology as, as the way you've just interpreted it? How did you come up with this?
Well, I would say, well, but I came up with it by the grace of God, just as I was given Ali as my partner in this endeavor by the grace of God. And when Ali converted, we had a very um, contentious relationship. He was young in college and uh, I'd known him when he was a teenager. And he, uh, very, very, very um, gifted young man, also very prideful um, and very uh, accomplished. Uh, we had a great contest of ideas over a period of almost probably a year or so. And then finally, Ali um, converted, he became Catholic. And I told Ali when he did, and Ali remember this, I told him, I said, Ali, this is big medicine. I said, I don't know what God has in store for us, but it's something big. God has put you and I together for some work. I don't know what it is, but he's not going to leave your conversion and your humility to in, and to come into the church um, was huge. And I knew, and lo and behold, he didn't, God didn't waste that. And he has used it. I would say to the people that this is a, of course, this is a totally different interpretation because everybody has always interpreted it, the mythology as being somehow associated with some we'll call it a fantastical history um, of the real material world. And it's not, it's a, it's a psychological world. That's why Tolkien calls it the secondary realm, which is in the mind. Um, and I would say that people have become so fanatical about it and so interested in it because it is not just beautiful and good. It's also true. It's true in a sense that it is, it, it's taking place this whole uh, battle against the evils and against artificial intelligence and Tower of Baradur, the Black Riders virtual reality and the chip is all taking place. And it's now it's coming up uh, first and foremost in the public mind as it should. And our intention is to reveal this now uh, for what it really is and bring J.R.R. Tolkien front and center in the middle of the contest between good and evil and reveal him, and there he is with Andrew Ling, Andrew, Andrew Ling, the, the sword, and uh, and he's fighting on our side, particularly the traditional Catholics. He was uh, very devoted um, as a traditional Catholic and very much uh, was no fan of Vatican II, to put it mildly. And we need to return to our tradition and we need to become saints. And he's right there and shows us the way in a very entertaining, engaging way. And uh, to fight this is this this mythology has been revealed in God's time, as J.R.R. Tolkien intended it to be. He wrote it and then he just set cast it forth into the future and left it in God's hands, and said, "Oh no no, there's nothing here to see, nothing here to see," and um, kept it under the radar. Otherwise, it would have been attacked and destroyed. Uh, and now it's time. It's it's arrived right on the battlefield, right when it's time right when the world needs it most and here he is and it's 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 all it's all revealed in our book yeah so i think you know i i had read tolkien's works before we started this project and i always felt like gosh there's something more to this but i can't put my finger on it and particularly once i became a catholic it felt like this was a very familiar environment a very familiar world there was some familiarity there but I couldn't quite place, it's like a face that you've seen before, but you couldn't quite place the the, the, the face. And um, and so I knew that there was something there. And I think that many Tolkien fans probably feel something similar to Absolutely. that. They can't quite put their finger on what it is. Um, and that thing is this, it is a thoroughly Catholic world. It is a scholastic worldview as, as Paul uh, pointed out. And the reason I think that we're uniquely positioned to unlock the, uh, the the proper way of interpreting the work is that Tolkien was taught um, he he was raised in reading the great books, the the classic works, and a classic uh, Catholic liberal education where he read the greatest works of Western civilization. He read Thomas Aquinas. He understood the teaching of the Church, uh, and then Paul is a self educated man who said about reading incidentally not unaware but the same books that tolkien had read himself uh, and then i came along later having been brought into the church by reading aristotle and plato and socrates and aquinas and augustine and so i was able to recognize these things as well and so but i will also still point out that i was a great skeptic of this interpretation too going into it and i felt i was helping even in the middle of the project i just was helping paul because 
because I love Paul and I'm grateful for all he's done for me. And so I said, well, I mean, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I'm just going to help you with this book anyway. Um, until there were enough these of these, it's like you, you lay over, you know, their games or whatever, you, you lay over a filter on top of something and it focuses in and it matches perfectly. Uh, and there were a couple of moments there. You know, one of them that comes to mind was, you know, we were talking about there are some some works that Tolkien wrote that didn't end up in the Silmarillion that they were left on the cutting room floor, but they reveal very clearly that Tolkien was thinking with a scholastic view of mind. He was looking at the the soul and the body, you know, separately um, and but together as one. And so this is very clearly scholastic scholasticism. Uh, and so and then bringing those together. Uh, along with some of the other clues about as we laid the interpretation of who's who and how they and based on our interpretation what it what it means what each person means and how it came together in the scene absolutely perfectly um like for example or you know goldberry you know <laughs> goldberry uh is you know you know the golden fruit of goldberry you know it, co it comes in laurel and and yeah. and how she is the sun right and and all of there's there's so many of these small things uh who the um the barda are and their their personalities and it was like one thing after another after another after another so there was all these things lined up into this perfectly you know you know clear picture that you just can't deny it because there there are so many things that line up beautifully so so for me, I became a believer about halfway through the project and said, this is amazing. What else can we can we learn through this? Yeah, I got to say, too, I remember the time we were in my camper van down at Ali's house and we were we were working. Uh, we were working on the mythology and um, and I was explaining what happened when uh, when uh, Niena, who happens to be the cognitive sense and Yavana, who's the reproductive power of reproduction, and they were trying to rehabilitate the trees and 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 Niena, the cognitive sense was washing the, the dead trees with her tears as as Yavana chanted trying to revive the trees and Ali perks up and goes oh my god this is contrition she's sorry Arda is sorry for having committed mortal sin and I'm like yeah he says I finally get it and I'm like huh he says, I, I understand now. I believe you. I said, what do you mean? He says, I just now, I just now believe you that your interpretation is correct. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. We've been working on this for four, three, four years. And I, and I said, <laughs> Ali, that's just the type of friend you are. You're just such a great friend. You're just here to help me. And, uh, and uh, it was, it was really, it was really a funny thing. So the Valar are the 14 powers of the soul, the facets of the soul, according to the scholastics. And they line up absolutely perfectly, of course, because it is a war between the scholasticism in uh, that came to an apex in Thomas Aquinas, uh, Contra Gentiles and Summa Theologia versus the dualism of, uh, of Descartes. So those are those two. And all of our problems in the world right now are have its roots in this poisonous idea of who and what we are and our nature. And we're suffering the severe consequences of dualism of Descartes. And it's it's caused all of our problems and it's and it's pushing us into transhumanism and it's gonna push us into uh, genocide. And that's the whole point is to put an end to God's creation. And I guess we all know who's at the bottom of that. So uh, Tim Poole, one of the commentators of that clip we watched uh, at the end there, he said that uh, these whistleblowers that were coming forth from uh, Google and uh, IBM and other big tech uh, organizations that were blowing the whistle on on the dangers of artificial intelligence. Um, he said these whistleblowers are, are starting to build a culture. And when he said that, my eyes lit up and I thought, wow, that that's a really uh, articulate, articulate and, and intelligent way to put it. I mean, you know, building a culture against what's going on in the world currently, and uh, I just I just thought that was really uh, a great way to, to put that. So um, he said that that's the way forward. That's how we combat uh, what we're up against here with the dangers of artificial intelligence. And 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 I guess what you're talking about now, the battle between good and evil, the both of you, how would you say we we combat 
uh, what's at stake. Would you agree with what Tim Poole said there? And, and I, I no, would. In not. fact, in our book, toward the end, we uh, we invite uh, scientists, people who are in the scientific community, um, to uh, to join us to change their attitude toward their work, um, to open their mind to uh, creation, to God, uh, the Creator, and um, to open their mind to the fact that their their work will advance much quicker and much more in a much more benevolent um the fruits will be much more benevolent when we return to god um so we invite uh the scientific community to do that but the number one thing that um that tim Poole, Car tucker carlson and company uh didn't bring up in that uh interview it was a good interview it caught my eye it's like you're talking about everything that's in our book and all the answers are in the book um is that cultivation of virtue, which is absolutely critical. Everybody can do that. You don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be a mathematician. You don't have to be a philosopher. You don't have to be any of those things. Uh, regardless of your intellectual capacity or your stature, economic, political, social stature, everybody can has equal opportunity to cultivate virtue. And that's the ultimate weapon. And the more that our society cultivates virtue, the less uh, vulnerable we are to the claws and the trap of artificial intelligence. And, you know, virtue is what really um, gave rise, Christianity, Catholic Christianity gave rise to Western civilization. And it was the first civilization that absolutely cultivated virtue and put the pagan ways of hedonism and, and all of the problems of paganism behind them. And Western culture rose and exploded and moved far beyond any other civilization in every way, technological, um, um, material, um, um, art, uh, everything that the, the, the Western culture exploded. And at the base, the fundamental base of that was Catholic virtue. So we have to return to that. Not a very popular subject these days. Everybody wants to slake their 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 vicious nature as a as a as a as an expression of freedom and there's nothing free about that you've enslaved yourself if you're not capable of restraining with temperance and that's frodo temperance is frodo if you're not capable of restraining that you're going to turn into gollum and gollum is intemperance that's why gollum calls uh frodo master but um we have to return to that that virtuous state and cultivate virtue and rise above and if we do um, we may not to be, we won't be able to prevent all of the negative effects of virtual, re of artificial intelligence, but we will not fall into the trap of transhumanism, the, uh, the death that's going to occur for millions of souls in the virtual realm. Um, um, we'll, we can avoid all of those things and it's available to everybody. It's a solution that's equally available to everybody. In fact, the more, the less economically uh, capable uh, that you are, the more, the more, uh, the, the less difficult it is to cultivate virtue because you're not, you don't have access or you don't have the ability. Um, look at these Hollywood people and whatnot that are, I mean, there's no virtue left there. So the, even the poor can consider themselves very lucky and fortunate to be in a situation where they can actually, they have easier access to cultivating virtue than mo than rich people. It's kind of like the, the eye of the camel that, that it'll be easier for a uh, camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so be, 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 we can be grateful if we're not terribly ac uh, economically uh, capable, if we're not rich, if we're not among the, you know, the, the upper class or whatever we actually have in many, in many instances, we're less tempted, we're less capable. Um, I'm not saying that in the ghettos and in the in the in some of these really tough areas that it's easy to cultivate virtue because it's not because vice has gotten such a hold there that's it's very difficult to get out of that but for most and people it's only going to get worse virtue. with artificial intelligence it sounds yeah. like it's it sounds like with this rise of artificial intelligence it's going to be so hard to live our lives where we can cultivate a cult uh, a culture of virtue uh when you know Everything we do, everything, our livelihoods, our, our, our banking, our, our, our shopping, our whatever, insert it, it's all online, it's all within this, this yeah. realm of virtual reality and artificial intelligence, and it's only 
getting more and more technologically advanced. Ali, what are some final thoughts you have for us on all of this, on, you know, virtue and and uh, that being the path forward? How can we, you know, uh, better do this in light of uh, what you've brought forward today with your book? You know, what are some of your final thoughts on all this? Yes, with regard to virtue, just to break it down for the layman, virtue is simply your habits. What habits do you have on a daily basis? And your character is the summation of all those little habits that you pick up, the for better or for worse. Uh, and the good habits are virtues and bad habits are, are sins or vices. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, for example, um, we talk about how virtue is the solution, but what we really mean is a prudent scientist would know that because something is possible doesn't mean it ought to be done, right? It, right. Just because we can create artificial intelligence that can you know, that can power autonomous weapons, we ought not to do that because of the, the, the manifest hazards. Um, a courageous human being would stand up and be a whistleblower and say, this is, there's something very evil about what's going on here. Um, uh, folks with virtue, that's what we need. We need people with courage, uh, with prudence, with uh, the litany of virtues to stand up and to, to have God at the center and in, in charge and align things. As Paul was talking about a, um, beneficence, a, a good society, but a society is better aligned with God as king and with us striving to be saints in building lives of virtue and doing the right thing and seeking truth in all things. And so that is the best outcome for us and for our society is for everyone to be striving to cultivate those good little habits that help us become saints. That was incredible. I mean, I've never heard it more clear in my life than uh, what the both of you just said. Um, I feel excited. I feel I feel very, very uh, um happy for the viewers of this video because I know that they're going to get so much out of this and um, that's why when I saw that clip I knew that that clip of, of you know those conservative commentators talking about this I knew that uh, you two were the right ones to interview about this because as Paul said it's everything they were talking about is written in, in your book so thank you both uh, for joining us here I know the life site is going to absolutely adore this interview and, and especially the Tolkien fans are going to get so much out of this and uh, really this is only just the beginning I mean we got that whole book to read. We got the whole mythology. There's so much that we can uh, discuss and keep talking about in this. So uh, it's great. Well, we, it's we, great we that you've brought this forward. And uh, thank you. Yeah, we barely scratched the surface. So this is a good start. <laughs> thank you, Miles. Thanks, well, Miles. Thank you both. God bless you.